Hey everyone! In this video, I'll be going over the basics of duplicate stitch, which is a color work technique used in knitting. I'll be showing you some of my favorite tips and tricks along the way. But before we get started, I would like to go over the four different types of color work that you will most likely find when you are knitting. One type of color work that you're probably already familiar with is called stranded knitting. I've used it here on my avalanche sweater coat. Stranded knitting is when you want to use two or more colors in any given row, and you're going to strand the color not in use along the back of the work. Now, fair isle knitting is a form of stranded knitting where you're using only two colors at a time. You've probably seen fair isle sweaters and fair isle hats or even worked some yourself. So I'll show you the back of this fabric here. You'll notice that on the bottom edge of this sweater, we have this repeating pattern of white squares along the black fabric. And on the back side of the fabric, you can see where the strands of the color that weren't in use were floated across the back of the fabric, and those are actually called floats. So that's what you're going to get on the back of the fabric of a stranded piece of knitting. Another form of color work that you're probably familiar with is called intarsia. Unfortunately, I don't have a real piece of intarsia knitting with me, but I do have my uh, avalanche sweater coat again, and that used intarsia a little bit with some of these shapes on the back with this snowflake motif. So instead of where, when you have stranded knitting and you're working a repeated pattern over in the entirety of a row, the difference with intarsia is when you're working a singular shape in a sea of another color. So this is gonna be useful when you have big blocks of color that you don't wanna strand a big strand of the color that comes before it, after it, because it's gonna create floats that are too long on the back of your fabric. So let me show you what the back of this looks like. So you'll see here that the back of these rectangles uh, from the front of the fabric are the same. They're white on the back. And I've sort of used a combination of intarsia and stranded knitting on these because I did strand the black across, but I wasn't stranding the white anywhere else. So when you use intarsia knitting, you have to kind of twist the colors together when you reach the new one on the back of the work so that you don't create holes along the sides where those colors meet. Another way to add color work to your knitting is to use slip stitches. There's a lot of different slip stitch color work techniques. Um, these two towels were both made using slip stitch work. Um, this is my Alsace tea towel and this is my new Brimfield dishcloth, both, both of which use two different colors to create um, a repeating pattern. So this one is made using the linen stitch and also in striping. So you can see a little bit where I've switched colors, but you still get a hint of the alternate color on the following row because the stitches are slipped up to the next row. With the Brimfield dishcloth, uh, it's a little bit more of a textured pattern. This one plays with both knit and purl stitches to give it this really unique, beautiful texture. At the same time, you are also alternating in rows. Usually with slip stitch knitting, you're using only ever one color for each two rows, so you don't have to keep cutting your ends at the end of each row when you add in a new color. You just carry it up the side of the work. A really special and beautiful form of slip stitch knitting is called mosaic knitting. And I use that technique on this piece here, which is my coast to coast wrap. Um, it uses several different charts of mosaic knitting patterns. So this one is supposed to represent a city. This is sort of like um, the power lines along the freeway and more of the flat states. These are supposed to represent mountains and these are waves. I knit this um, on a cross country drive from California to New York. So it's kind of the transition of the different landscapes that we drove past along the way. Um, but mosaic knitting is really beautiful. Again, it typically uses charts because you're going to have different repeats that are much easier to read from a chart than from a written line by line pattern. Um, this pattern actually does include both fully written instructions as well as charts. And you can check this out on my blog and I will put links to all the patterns that I've referenced here in the description below. 
Um, but mosaic knitting is a really lovely technique. Again, you're going to be working only one color every two rows, but it does require having multiple skeins of yarn because of those two colors attached to your work at any given time. And the last type of color work that you may or may not have heard of is called duplicate stitch, also known as Swiss darning. And this is what we are going to be learning today. This is my Tiger Ringer Tee. This is my newest pattern out that uses duplicate stitch. I've used it for several different patterns in the past, and it's one of my favorite techniques for a few different reasons. Um, duplicate stitch is not worked while you are actually knitting your project. It is what's considered an afterthought. So it's put onto the fabric after all of your knitting is already complete. And typically it uses stockinette fabric because it's nice and flat and you can see where the little V's of your stitches are very easily. And one of the reasons that I really love this is because you can put duplicate stitch onto a piece of work that you've knit yourself or onto a store-bought piece. It is such a great way to personalize something, especially if you're giving a gift. You can monogram using duplicate stitch and it just really adds a special little touch to something. Uh, another great reason that um, I've used it many times is that often you don't know exactly with something like this. Uh, I wasn't sure exactly where I wanted to place it on the tee while I was knitting it, so I waited until the end, also because this pattern is written for eight different sizes, and I wasn't sure exactly how the tiger face would look on each of those sizes, so I wanted you to be able to place it where you prefer on your t-shirt and not have it be in a specific spot. Um, so the other reason that this is great is that since it's an afterthought, it's really just an embroidery technique. What you're doing is working over each of the stitches with a different color. This is the chart that goes along with this pattern. And each of these numbers represents one of the stitches. Each of these represents one of the rows. And it's really just a grid system of your fabric. So you're basically just embroidering over each of these little squares, which corresponds to the different V stitches of your stockinette fabric. So this is a totally beginner friendly technique because of that you're not going to have to hold multiple balls at the same time or struggle with all these different strands of yarn um, because it is just something that you're going to do at the end. Because of that also it's much easier to control your tension and to make sure that there aren't holes where the different colors meet. With intarsia knitting you often get holes along the edge of where two colors meet because the stitches aren't full stitches because you're switching from one color to another. Um, and with stranded knitting, you're going to have some issues with tension because of all the floats on the back. So with this, it's much easier to control the tension. Also, when you are working many of those other color work techniques that I mentioned, you're going to possibly struggle with how to weave in all of those ends of all those colors. It's going to make the fabric super thick. And what I love about duplicate stitch is because it's like embroidery, you can really just, and maybe I'll get some backlash for this, but you don't have to weave in your ends. I've simply tied off all of the colors, leaving about half inch or three quarters of an inch tail here, and just tying a triple knot super, super tight to make sure that it doesn't unravel. I've washed plenty of my duplicate stitch knitting projects over and over again. They've never come undone. And the best part is that if you, one of your colors comes undone in one of the other color work techniques, your entire project is going to fall apart because that strand of yarn is part of the fabric. Whereas with this, it's done on top of the fabric. So even if some of these stitches come loose, your whole shirt is not going to fall apart. The sweater will not come undone. It will not unravel. And you can easily just go back and fix the little areas that came unraveled from the different color work. But again, I highly doubt that will ever happen. I've never had trouble with this and I've never woven in these ends. I just leave a, a long enough tail to where when I do wash it, even if these come slightly, slightly loose, they're not gonna totally come undone any of those knots. So this is, yeah, this is what the back of the fabric looks like with duplicate stitch. And with that, Let's get started. Now, quickly, before we dive in, two more sort of tips and tricks that I wanted to mention. Before you begin, you really wanna make sure that your base fabric is nice and blocked. 
And the reason for this, here's this little swatch that I'm gonna be working with to demonstrate the duplicate stitch. The reason for this is not only does it create this really beautiful even tension fabric that where it's much easier to see the stitches and the stitch definition, it's gonna just be a, a better base to work with. You also need to keep in mind that when you block fabric, it can shrink or expand. So you want your fabric to be at the final gauge before you're then duplicating all of the stitches. If your fabric, if you do your duplicate stitch before you block it and your fabric shrinks, all of these duplicate stitches are going to be bigger than the stitches underneath of the base fabric and it can cause all sorts of little puckering along the edges. If your base fabric expands when it is blocked, then it can stretch and pull on these duplicate stitches causing the base fabric to show through the duplicate stitch. So you just want to make sure that you've got a nice even blocked uh, base fabric to work with to just make everything easier and cause less headaches. The next thing I wanted to mention is the length of the yarn that you're gonna be using to do your duplicate stitches with. I like to say about a yard or a wingspan length to start with because if it's any longer than that, it's gonna cause tons of frustration because it's just gonna to continue to get tangled over and over again as you're embroidering with it. And that is very frustrating. This can be a really meditative technique. So you wanna make sure that this length isn't gonna to be too annoying. Um, if it's too short, then you're just gonna be cutting it a lot more. Uh, you're gonna to have to cut new lengths a lot more and you're just gonna to have to tie, out, tie it off a bunch more on the back of the fabric. So sometimes if I were to work, say, this whole big swath of this one color, most likely I'll have to use several strands of that color to accomplish all of that space. Because if my yarn is only this long, I may be only able to do this little area here. I may run out before I could, say, finish all the way up here. Um, but that's okay. Uh, when you have only about six inches left of your length, then you're just going to cut a new length leave that tail, the six inches, on the back of the fabric and start a new one. Come up from the bottom of the fabric. You can always tie them off, tie them together afterwards. It is no problem at all. So um, yeah, just be mindful of that length. It's definitely easier to have more things to tie off in the end than it is to be frustrated the whole time because this is too long. So those are just my tips before we get started. Without further ado, here we go. Okay, so for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to be working this very simple chart onto a little swatch that I knit up here. Um, but the technique is the same regardless. If you're doing a simple chart like this, or if you're doing something much more complicated like the tiger face, you're going to be doing the same technique. And I just wanted to talk about when you have an existing piece of knitwear, how do you know what kind of yarn you should be using for your duplicate stitch? If you don't have access to the same yarn that you used for the original project, you want to find something that is the same gauge. And the reason for that is, let me show you this tiger ringer tee again. With this pattern, I used Lion Brand's uh, LB Collection Superwash Merino for all of it. So it's all the same yarn. And what that means is that the thickness of the yarn that I use for the duplicate stitch is the same thickness as the base fabric. And because of that, you're not going to be able to see through these duplicate stitches to the bottom of the fabric. Um, if I pull these apart, you can kind of see that background fabric. But for the most part, this is a really solid design here, and you're not going to see the base fabric poking up through. If the yarn that you use for your duplicate stitch is too thin, if it's thinner than the yarn that you used for your base, you're going to be able to see it popping through underneath the, um, the duplicate stitch. You're going to see that base fabric. And with something like this, where you have a large space, you're really going to want the gauge to be the same because if the yarn that you're using for the duplicate stitch is too thick, it's going to make this puff up and be thicker than your base fabric. And you're going to get some pushing out. You're going to have this fabric um, that's on your base here be pushed out because these stitches are going to be taking up more room than your base stitches did. So you really, if you're doing a big swath of duplicate stitch like this, you're going to want to make sure that the yarn that you're using for the duplicate stitch is the same thickness as the yarn for the base fabric. However, if you're doing something like this little design here, or if you're just doing a little monogram, then it's okay to use a yarn that is just ever, ever so slightly thicker. And what that's going to do is that will help the stitches that you're doing in duplicate stitch 
lift up from the fabric a little bit more and really pop off of the background. And that will help them also to prevent the base fabric from showing through. I am actually using the exact same yarn, just in a different color for this tutorial. This is Lion Brand Woolies, and this base color is the Natural Heather, and this is the charcoal color that I'm gonna be doing the duplicate stitch in, so you can really see the contrast between these two colors. Something else that you'll need when you do duplicate stitch is some sort of either little marking pins like these. These are by Clover. I will link to these in the description as well or some removable stitch markers, some locking stitch markers. Um, I use either or, doesn't really matter. You can also use bobby pins. You can also use a washable fabric marker if you plan on washing your project after you've done the duplicate stitch to sort of mark where these stitches will be on the fabric. Um, but for the purposes of this, again, I'm just gonna actually probably use these guys. So what you wanna do is look at your chart this is 10 stitches by 10 rows. You're gonna to wanna to correspond that with stitches on your base fabric. So I'm going to just place this kind of somewhere in the center here. Again, this is just a little swatch, so it doesn't matter too much. I'm just going to mark my bottom stitch, um, the bottom row here. And then I'm gonna count up 10 stitches, 10 rows to where the top of the chart will be. So if this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So this is going to be the bottom most, one of these bottom most stitches here. And this corresponds to this top row here. Then I also need 10 stitches across. So let's say this is the sixth one, seven, eight, nine, 10. So in between these two stitches, this row of stitches, this is going to be the edge. You can see these Vs here are actually gonna be this length of stitches here. And because this is one, then we've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 is this row. So I'm gonna place that marker after that row. And this is essentially corresponding to the stitches of this little chart. So I am probably going to start in the bottom right-hand corner. Usually color work charts in knitting start in the bottom right-hand corner, so I'm sort of just doing that out of habit. Really, you can do this. You can start anywhere on a chart. Um, I would recommend starting either in a corner or along one of the sides, so you can use that as a reference when you're finishing off your duplicate stitch, and then it's easier to correspond and see where the other stitches are going to go. So if we're gonna start, um, I'm gonna start along this bottom edge. Another thing to note is that you can work duplicate stitch right to left, left to right, up, down, up, or up, down. It doesn't matter the direction that you go in, and oftentimes in a project, you're going to be going in all the directions. Uh, so with this, I'm going to start right here with this stitch. So that is going to be, this is our bottom row, and we are going to be, this is our side, right side. So I want the stitch that when I bring these two lines together, it meets. It's a little bit difficult to tell with this ball here. Uh, but that's going to not be this one, not this one, not this one, but this stitch right here. You can see how this stitch is part of the rightmost column and the bottommost row. Okay, so now that I know where that is, and it corresponds to this, since this is just a straight line, I can actually remove this marking pin because I no longer need it to show me where that bottom is. Duplicate stitch is really just retracing all of the stitches of your existing knitwear. So you don't have to guess anything. You're just going to be tracing the line of the yarn as it moves through each of the stitches. So with this being the first stitch, you can see here, this is the little V of the stitch. I am going to begin my duplicate stitch by putting my yarn up from the back of the fabric up through the bottom of that V. So I'm just going to use my nail to mark where that spot is. I'm gonna take this out. Again, going from the underside of the fabric up 
I'm going to insert it right at the base of where that V is. And I'm just gonna pull it through. Now, I like to leave about a six inch tail on the back of the work. Again, not to weave in, but just to tie off in the end. And sometimes with duplicate stitch, as with any color work, you know, it can pull and tug a little bit. So I like to leave a nice long tail so it, I don't accidentally pull it all the way through the fabric. So with this first, first stitch here, again, we're just going to retrace, this is the V of my stitch. I'm just gonna retrace the way the yarn on the base fabric goes. So it's gonna go up and then underneath the two legs of the stitch above, that's its first movement. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the yarn through. And then that yarn, if I'm tracing it, it goes back down the other side of the V, back into the bottom of that V. Now, before I move forward, I need to know what the next stitch I'm going to duplicate is, which in this case, I'm going from right to left along my little chart here, right to left. So I know that the next stitch is where I want to come up into the bottom of the next stitch, which is right here. And you can see the yarn on the base fabric even goes in that direction. It goes behind this, down, under, and back up. So that is where I'm going to duplicate stitch. Also, I no longer need this marking pin because I know where that first column starts. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that as well. Okay, so let's pull this all the way through. That is one stitch duplicated. So this stitch, once again, corresponds to this bottom stitch here. Now I'm gonna go ahead and work all the way across that bottom row. We've got 10 stitches total. So once more, this stitch goes up the little V and then underneath the legs of the stitch above it. Go ahead and pull that through. And then it goes back down the other side of the V into that center bottom again. And then we're gonna go up underneath bottom of the V of the stitch to the left. We've got two duplicate stitches on our fabric. So once again, we're gonna trace that yarn up underneath the two legs of the stitch above it. Pull it through. And then we're gonna go tracing it back down into the bottom of that V and then come up one stitch to the left and pull it through. Now we have three duplicate stitches. Continuing on, we go up under those two legs, pull it through back into that same V and up into the stitch just to the left. Now, let's say that while you're working, you happen to notice that one of these stitches is much tighter than all the stitches around it. So let's tighten up one of these stitches so I can show you how to fix that. This is why I love duplicate stitch because it really allows you to play with the tension and make sure that everything is even along the way. So you can see this little leg here looks much shorter than these that I worked before it. So how am I going to sort of tighten that, or sorry, loosen this so that these stitches have the same tension as the ones on either side? What I like to do is use my tapestry needle to just lift that leg up Pull it a little bit and lift both legs at the same time, the same stitch, to sort of pop this alternate color up from the base fabric. And then I'm going to give a little bit more slack that I can add in to these stitches. And I'm just going to kind of retrace my steps, tugging gently on each of those to even out the tension and make those really flat and beautiful and even. So just continuing down this row, 
great way to make sure also that you know your base fabric isn't showing through too much but it's much easier to have a consistent tension with duplicate stitch than it is with stranded knitting or intarsia where you're holding all of those colors at the same time. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. This is number seven. is number eight. That's nine. And this is going to be the tenth stitch. Once again, I've now reached this far left column of these stitches, so I can remove that marking pin as well. And just complete that last duplicate stitch of this row. And there you have that first line of stitches. Now, once again, now we need to decide before I close out this stitch, I need to decide where my next stitch is gonna be so that I know where to bring my needle up. And in this case, according to our little chart here, since this is the closest stitch, I'm now gonna work this second row back from left to right. So in order to work this stitch that's just above that one, I am just going to close out this current stitch by going into the bottom of the V, and then I'm gonna come up just underneath that back bar on, into the bottom of the V of the stitch right above it. So now I've closed out that last stitch of this row, and now I'm going to work in the same direction going up, underneath the legs above and back down into the bottom of that V. But now the next stitch that I'm gonna work is the one just to the right of it. So I need to come up right into that V. Again, make sure your tension is nice and even. It's much easier to fix the tension along a row than it is to fix something over here after you've already gone up into the next row. So take a look at that one before you move along. So again, you can work this a couple different ways. You can continue going underneath and down and then over to the right, or now you can trace the yarn in the opposite direction. So technically you can go from left to right, follow this up and then behind those two legs of the stitch above and then down, back into the bottom V of that stitch, coming up into the V, bottom of the V of the following stitch to the right. It really doesn't matter if you are doing it this way or crisscrossing them. In the end, you're duplicating the stitch either way, so it's gonna look the same from the front of the fabric, which is really all that matters in this case. So underneath those two legs above, Moving this out of the way, back down into the base of that V, and then up into the V of the following stitch to the right. And you're just going to go, in this case, all the way back over, duplicating each of these stitches. There's 10 of them. All the way across to where we began. The tighter you pull these stitches, the more likely you're going to be able to see the fabric underneath. So I like to keep these fairly loose and fluffy so that they pop off of that fabric and completely cover it up. And that way it looks like this was done while you were knitting the fabric. It doesn't even look like duplicate stitch. It just looks like part of the fabric. 
coming up to our last stitch here in this row. Up. There we go. Okay. And now I'm going to go ahead and work up this entire column of stitches. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this one as well because I know that there are 10 stitches since we are working this very basic chart. We've only got 10 here. I've already got two while well, I'm about to complete the second one in that column. So again, to complete this stitch, we're gonna go back into the bottom of the V and the next stitch that I'm gonna work is the one right above it. So I'm just gonna go underneath and come right up the V of that stitch on top. Same thing underneath the legs of the stitch above, back into the base of that V coming up at the base of the V just above. All right, so that's three. We're just gonna do that all the way up again, three. So this is gonna be the fourth one. And see how this kind of curled underneath that stitch there? I'm just gonna wiggle that by inserting this underneath that leg and pull it up just ever so slightly. I manipulated it a bit just to sit right on top of that base fabric to cover it up completely so you can't see the base fabric through. So this is the fourth stitch that we're completing now. Coming up. This is going to be the fifth one. Is number six. A little too tight there. Okay. This is seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is going to be. Eight. Nine. And our final stitch is 10. Like all the other times when we were switching directions, you want to make be mindful of where your next stitch is going to be before you close this one out. So we're going to close this out by inserting into the bottom of that final stitch. And then the next stitch we're going to be working is the one just to the left because I'm going to work this column back down and show you how to do duplicate stitch in that direction. So if you just retrace this yarn on the base fabric, you can see that it comes up right here, which is the base of the stitch just to the left of this one that we're finalizing now. And this is worked the same way again. You're just going to go underneath the two legs of the stitch above. You're going to go down into the base of that V. And this time, the next stitch we're going to work is right below it. So we're just going to go underneath this one bar here into the base of this V of the stitch below. And go underneath the legs, not only of the duplicate stitch, but of the base fabric too. So we're actually going under four strands here, the two legs of the stitch of the base fabric above and the two legs of the duplicate stitch above. Okay, go back down into the base of that, base of that V, up underneath the base of the V below. Again, going under all four legs of both layers above, down into the base of that V and up, into the base of the one below. And you're just going to continue doing that all the way down this column of stitches. Keeping an even tension. You can kind of stretch it both ways too to get those to elevate a little bit from the base fabric. Pop up really nicely. Got one more stitch here and our little motif is complete. 
So I'm gonna poke that back down completely through the back of the fabric. You can see that this is really nice. You can't see the base fabric through that at all. And on the back of the fabric now, we have these two tails. So usually um, when I'm doing duplicate stitch, I'll finish all of my duplicate stitch and leave the tails about six inches on the back. And then when I'm ready to finish everything, I find tails that are next to each other and just tie those together in a knot, triple knot. So that's what I'm gonna do with these. First one, you wanna keep kind of loose because you don't wanna to pull too tightly or it will shrink the stitches on the other side of the front of the fabric. So I'm just gonna tie that first one a little bit loose being mindful that this one doesn't pull those either. And then tying uh, the third one. And I can pull that one nice and tight. And this is a wool acrylic blend. So because of the wool content, again, I'm gonna cut about half an inch, three quarters of an inch uh, to leave those little tails there. Um, because this does have wool in it, it is going to tangle a little bit. Um, when it's worn just from friction or when it's washed. And so it is gonna nicely kind of tangle that little knot together and it's definitely not gonna come undone. But if you're using a really slippery fabric like cotton or bamboo or silk or something like that, what you can do is actually separate the plies of the yarn if you're, when your tail is longer. See how I've separated those plies there. And you can then, again, this you would need your tails to be much longer, but you can put each of those separated plies onto your needle and tie those around one of the purl bumps um, of, your, of your duplicate stitch. Maybe one goes this direction and one goes that direction. You can kind of weave under a few stitches and tie them. So they're going in different directions and that way you've just really secured those knots. You've got multiple knots, they're not gonna come undone. But what I said in the beginning of the video about not weaving in my ends of duplicate stitch, another reason that I don't do that is because you're already making this fabric much thicker, twice the thickness as uh, the fabric was when it was just the base fabric. So then to weave in those ends, which many people use actually a form of duplicate stitch to actually weave in their ends, you're going to be adding just another layer of fabric and it can really make the fabric too thick in those areas. And you're going to get all sorts of puckering. So I feel like this prevents that from happening a little bit. Um, and again, I've never had them come undone. It keeps a nice clean finish look to the front of the fabric. And there you have our little swatch and that is how you would do duplicate stitch. I wanted to add as well, when you have a complex chart like this Tiger Ringer T chart, um, I actually started this in this sort of bottom of his chin here. And what I did was I worked with only black, which here you can see is the contrast color three. I worked with only black and I kind of filled in all of this little area here. I like to work in different sections one at a time instead of doing all of the black stitches all at once and then coming back with another one, I really wanted to sort of complete different little areas at a time and I worked this chart from the bottom up. It is totally your preference how you want to do it. It really doesn't matter because again on the front of the fabric it's all going to look the same. It doesn't matter really how it looks on the back. You wouldn't want to say if you finished this little black section to then jump without cutting your yarn to this stitch over here and begin this black section from this over here because then you're gonna have a really long float on the back of the work that may tug and may pull your stitches. So instead, you just work this little area here, cut your yarn, it doesn't matter how many tails are because you're just gonna tie those off and you don't have to weave them in. And then I worked this little section of contrast color one. And then I think I came in maybe right about here and worked this contrast color two all the way to over here. Then I did this little section of contrast color, sorry, this is contrast color two, and then this little section of contrast color one. And then I had this whole little area finished down here. And what that did also is because I had this base, it was much easier to reference where all of these colors would go. And I would obviously look at the chart multiple times in between each stitch, but it just helped me understand where I needed to place those rather than starting at where I had marked off the edges of the chart and having to count in all those stitches before I knew where to place these. I could just reference where the colors were of the other colors and it helped me place those stitches much easier. So again, I worked this from the bottom up, kind of filling in different areas one at a time until the whole thing was complete. And then I flipped the fabric over and tied off all of those ends 
on the interior of the project. So there are a couple of areas where I do have some floats here. I think I was super pressed for time <laughs> when I was trying to finish this before the photo shoot. Um, but I wouldn't definitely wouldn't recommend any floats that are longer than those because you're gonna, when you're putting it on, they can get caught on jewelry, um, on your fingers and stuff. And then it's just gonna kind of pull the front of your fabric. So you wanna make sure to avoid that. But once again, this is such a beautiful way to add a really special, unique touch to an existing piece of knitwear. You can go back and add this to any sweater you've ever made. Um, I would encourage you to look up videos and information on how to use duplicate stitch for mending. Um, it's a great technique to fill in uh, holes and threadbare parts of elbows of sweaters and stuff like that. Um, and it's just a really useful technique to know how to do. Again, beginner friendly, something that you can do as an afterthought. And there you have it. I hope you will start adding duplicate stitch to some of your existing projects. I hope that you will check out the projects that I've mentioned in this tutorial. I'll be linking them all below. Make sure you tag me on Instagram and Facebook. I am at two of wands on both. I love to see your projects and please comment below if you have any questions. Thanks so much.